Hello world, this is Craig. Welcome to part four of the single wire interface videos. In part three, we went through the data sheet on the Cortex, and now we're going to actually look at the code. The first thing we do is set up our port, and we do this by first configuring the mode, and then the output type, the output speed, and the pull up, pull down registers. In line 237, for example, we clear the mode bits for this port, and then in 238, we set the bit that we want to get our target pattern. And of course, we don't just make this stuff up. These masking bits are available in the STM32F407XX.h file. And so we can look, uh, here's our mode bits, our masking bits for uh, port 11. If we want to do them both, we can use this mask. If we want the lower bit, we use this one. If we want the higher bit, we can use that one. So we just use those masks to first clear both bits and then set the bit that we want. For the output type, we want to set that to a one, so we just set it. We don't care what it was before. For the speed, we want that to be pattern one, one, so we just set them both. And then for the pull up, pull down, we clear them and then we set the least significant bit. So once we've set our port up, it's now ready to output anything, but at the same time, it's also reading and it has this slight pull-up resistor to provide the pull-up. We have a macro that then floats the bus. We actually call this floating the bus rather than single wire high. This is called single wire float, and it just releases the bus or it sets the output register to one. We then do our initialization by taking the bus low for 720 microseconds. This allows all the devices to power down and then we let it go high, which all the, all the devices then start powering back up. We do a test at this point to make sure that the bus did go high. And so we repeat the high test that we did previously, make sure that it's gone high. If not, we return an error. We then wait until we're in the middle of the time slot and we sample the bus. You can see in this case, we have this little bit of code in here that sends out a test spike so we can see exactly when we sample. And that's this test spike that we're seeing on TP11. So here is where we initialize the bus. We let it go high. We tested it during that high point to make sure that it went high. And then we sampled the bus to make sure that there was a presence. There was a presence flag, so we're satisfied that there's a device. And then we finally do a quick test to make sure that the bus goes high afterwards, that somehow the bus isn't shorted out now. And if the bus does go high, we return that the initialization was successful. So the actual routine that sends out the logic is very simple. If we want to send out a logic low, we pull the bus low to start our time state. We then wait for the 60 microseconds, and then we let the bus go back high again. If we want to send out a logic one, then we simply do a quick clock by taking the bus low for five microseconds, and then we release it. We wait the rest of the time state and then we return. We have a little routine to send out a hex byte. This simply takes the character and strobes out each bit onto the bus, least significant bit first. We have a routine to read a byte from the device. Bits are read in from the least significant bit to the most significant bit. We do the same thing. We send out a quick clock strobe and then we wait until we're in the middle of the time slot and then we receive the bit and then we tack it on to the left side of all the bits that we've received so far. So those are the basics of writing a bit, writing a byte, or reading a byte. We now put these together and we can read the information we want out of the device. In this case, we're looking for the ROM. And in this application, we're looking for the MAC address upon startup of our code. So this is actually the routine that calls the initialization. It sends out command 33 and gets the response. And in this device, it's going to read the family code as 8.9. If it doesn't read an 8.9, then it returns an error. This little for loop then reads in the last seven bytes of the ROM. The first six bytes it reads are the MAC address, and the last byte is the CRC. And you can see with each byte that we read in, we add it to the CRC. Now this little routine will return either a zero if it's successful, a one if the bus didn't float after initialization, two if there was not a presence bit, and three if the bus never recovered to the high state after the presence bit. So let's look at this zero if successful. You can see here that we are actually returning the CRC. With this 33 command, we're going to receive first the family byte, then the six bytes of the MAC address, 
And finally, we're going to receive the CRC byte. We start with a CRC of zero. We then add in the family byte. We add in the six MAC address bytes, and that will give us the CRC that should match the last byte. Now with the DAO CRC, if we add that last CRC byte to our running CRC, we will get zero. So if we look back at our logic probe, we can see here's our read command, 3-3 that we sent out onto the bus. And here, starting from this point, is where we received back the family code. And each of these represent where we sampled that bit. Then after the family code, we receive the six bytes of the MAC address. And after the six bytes of the MAC address, we receive the CRC. In this case, it's a 1-9. So if we were to look at the CRC after we have received the family byte and after we've received the six bytes of the MAC address, we would have the value 1-9. If we now take that 1-9 and we add that to the CRC, the CRC becomes zero. We have one more section of code that we use to read the EEPROM. We send out the command F0, which is the read the memory. We then give it the low byte of the address where we want to start, the high byte of the starting address. And then we read in the 14 bytes that are available in, the, in this first page of the EEPROM. There's actually 32 bytes in this page of the EEPROM, but the higher bytes are unused. If we go back to our logic probe, you can see our salier. We have our analyzer on it, our one wire analyzer. And so the analyzer actually knows what each of these conditions are. And so it tells us that that's the reset. This is the presence condition. This is our read ROM command. It knows this is the family code, 89. It knows that this is the ROM code that we've read. And it knows that that's the CRC. This is the code to read the EEPROM, the low byte of the starting address, the high byte of the starting address. And then this is the CRC that the device sent back to us. It was the CRC of the command and the two addresses. And you can see from the data sheet on this chip what's in this EEPROM. The first byte is the length. It's going to be a 0A. The next four bytes are the project ID. And then it has three byte serialization and a three byte constant, which is the company ID, followed by the CRC. And the upper 19 bits are unused. So that's the information coming back in. There's our 0A. The next four bytes are the constant, 291100000. Next three bytes are the serial number. And then finally, there's the company, or the manufacturer ID. The low byte is 356000, and then the CRC. Okay, well that's it for part four. Only a couple parts to go. Part five is very short. We're just going to look at the DS2502-E48 in detail. And then finally we'll finish up with looking at the CRC, how it's calculated, and then the code to do that. Okay, well thanks for joining us again, and uh, I hope that the video was useful. Thank you, bye.